Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at the effect of ADH, how ADH increases permeability, increasing water potential, decreasing water potential, and then we'll finish with a summary. So ADH is a hormone that's released from the brain, and it stands for antidiuretic hormone. And the area that it's released from is called the posterior pituitary gland. And this is an area which basically lies below the brain, so at the base of the brain, and it's released in a particular scenario in response to low water potential of the blood. So it's released when we don't have enough water in the blood or when we're thirsty. So when it's released from the pituitary gland, it travels in the blood to the kidneys. So remember, a hormone is basically a chemical that's released from a particular gland. And the hormone travels via the blood usually or other medium or media at a certain distance site to cause an effect. So they travel and then they have their action upon a distant target. So in exactly the same way, the posterior pituitary gland releases ADH. The ADH travels via the blood system and eventually reaches the nephrons in the kidney. And it's here that it has its effect. So specifically, the cells lining the collecting ducts of the nephron and also the distal convoluted tubule just before it as well, have receptors on their cells for the ADH hormone. So as well as travelling through the blood and acting at a distant site, the hormone then, once it's travelling, needs to be able to bind to a receptor that's looking for it, or the receptor basically is waiting for the hormone to bind specifically because they're complementary. So this is the ADH molecule, and here we have an ADH receptor, which is a protein molecule which is complementary to the shape of the ADH molecule. And the cells that have this receptor are the cells located on the collecting duct of the nephron. And because the cells face the blood capillaries which is running alongside the nephron, the ADH simply has to diffuse out of the blood and straight to the cells on their basal side which line the collecting duct. So the overall response to ADH and the purpose of releasing ADH is to increase the permeability of the collecting duct to water. So remember the filtrate that's been travelling through the nephron is rich in various things but through the course of the nephron Ions, glucose, amino acids, etc. have been reabsorbed back into the blood. But at this point, the collecting duct still has water in it. And that water is going to start leaving and be reabsorbed into the medulla and then eventually the blood because the loop of Henle has set up a very salty environment around this area. So ADH is going to increase even further the permeability of this to let water out and be reabsorbed. And this is important for getting back some water potential into the blood. And the process whereby water travels from the collecting duct into the medulla is down a gradient and it's called osmosis. So the water will move into a salty medullary tissue set up by the loop of Henle and the ADH allows this to happen at a much greater rate. Once the water has entered the medullary tissue, it can freely diffuse or move by osmosis into the blood capillaries surrounding the nephron. And then when the filtrate moves into the bladder, eventually, that filtrate will be a lot more concentrated and have less water. This means less water is lost in urine and the urine becomes very, very concentrated. So how does ADH actually increase the permeability of these collecting duct cells to water? Well, the first step is what we've already mentioned, whereby ADH, after traveling by the blood, reaches its receptors on the basal side of the cells of this collecting duct and also part of the distal tubule as well. And then it can take its effect. So just to illustrate again, the ADH is travelling in the blood and the receptor waiting for it is complementary in shape for the ADH. Once the ADH and the receptor have bound together to make a complex, an enzyme which is inside the cell becomes active and this enzyme is known as phosphorylase. So all you need to know for now about this enzyme is that it removes a phosphate group from a protein and the interaction of the receptor and its hormone makes this enzyme now active so it can go and do stuff. Inside the cell, this activated phosphorylase causes vesicles, so membrane-bound vesicles, which contain a channel called aquaporin to move to the apical side of the cell. So let's just run through that here. So we've got our activated phosphorylase, and what the enzyme does is it acts upon these vesicles to cause a change. So what this is, is it's a vesicle, which is basically a membrane-bound sphere found within cells. And vesicles are there, and you may remember that vesicles are found in synapses, 
to fuse with membranes and start releasing things. Well in this way, the vesicle is going to fuse with the membrane, but instead of releasing something, it's just going to put what are these things that are stuck in its own membrane into this membrane. And these small channels are the aquaporins. So they're basically just small protein channels. So the aquaporin itself is a special type of protein channel which lets a lot of water move through it through the membrane. So you may think that cells are normally permeable to water moving through it anyway, but in the case of the collecting duct, it's a lot less permeable. So it needs these channels or aquaporins to allow the water to move from the duct out to the medulla. And it's designed in such a way that a lot of water can move out of the collecting duct cell and into the interstitial fluid. So the ADH basically causes the vesicles of aquaporin to fuse with the apical membrane. And when they fuse, they become the same membrane overall. And then they place these aquaporin channels into the membrane that faces the tubular fluid. And therefore we've increased the permeability of the duct to the water. Because now the membranes have fused and these aquaporin channels or aquaporins are now allowing water to go from the filtrate into the cell. And then from here, they'll go down their gradient into the medulla. So water then moves out of the tubule by osmosis into the medulla and then into the blood that surrounds the area. So the urine becomes more concentrated, we have less water loss and we can retain water into the blood. So this is useful when we need water or we need to keep more water, for example if we're dehydrated. The aquaporin channels that get recruited to the membrane also allow urea to pass through. So the urea can pass out of the aquaporin channels, reduce the water potential of the medulla and allow even more water to be removed. So most of the urea will end up going through filtrate and being excreted because that's what we want to do with it. But now and then, when these aquaporin channels have been recruited with ADH, some of it will be released to the medulla. This isn't because we want to keep the urea, it's just a consequence of this channel being permeable to it, but it actually helps the water leave because it reduces the water potential. So let's talk about two scenarios of water potential changing through the blood and how ADH can affect that. So the action of osmoreceptors, which are a specific type of cell found in the hypothalamus, the hormone ADH and the collecting duct all make up part of a negative feedback system or a negative feedback loop for osmoregulation. So osmoregulation is basically the regulation of the osmolality of the blood or the balance between water potential and salts. And this is really important to maintain because if we change this, then our structure of our cells changes and a lot of our functions start to fail. So a negative feedback loop has this general pattern. So imagine this straight line is the water potential that we want to maintain in our blood and through our cells. Because of things like drinking, dehydration, sweating, and general movement through life, water potential will sometimes go up and sometimes it will go down. But the loop of osmoreceptors, the action of ADH, and the effector of the collecting duct will always bring these changes back down to what they should be. So they'll try and reduce it if it's too high, and bring it up if it's too low. And overall, there'll be an oscillating pattern keeping it generally around the right level of water potential. And this is a negative feedback loop. So let's say that first of all, the water potential in our blood decreases below a set point, the set point being that which we want it to be. This is then detected by cells in the hypothalamus called osmoreceptors. So they're a type of neuron that respond to the level of water in the blood. And if there's not enough water in the blood, so if there's a reduced water potential, they start to shrink and they start to become smaller. So these act as the detectors in the feedback loop. When they detect this, they cause increased ADH to be released from the posterior pituitary gland, which is just below the hypothalamus. So here we have, again, the hypothalamus. We have this osmoreceptor. And once it's detected that there's been a drop in water potential, it will trigger the cells of the posterior pituitary gland to release ADH into the blood. So osmoreceptors were the detectors, but ADH is the coordinator in this feedback loop. The ADH increases the permeability of the collecting duct in the processes that we just talked about, and it results in less water being lost in urine and more of it being reabsorbed. So the collecting duct is now the effector. So we had a release of ADH traveling into the blood, and eventually via the blood, it reached the nephron. And then at the nephron, it acted on its own receptors, causing increased aquaporins to be recruited to the membranes. And then water left the filtrate into the medulla to be reabsorbed into the blood. 
So because we're now taking more water back into the blood, the water potential is going to go back up, and it's going to go back to its normal level. And this results in the urine becoming concentrated. So overall, we've got this kind of feedback loop where we've got detection, whereby those osmoreceptors detected a low water potential. In the next stage, ADH was released from the posterior pituitary gland, which is the coordinator. The ADH then went to act on the collecting ducts, and the collecting ducts are the effector, and in doing so, allowed water to be absorbed into the medulla, which then got absorbed into the blood to raise the water potential back up to a normal level. And so this has resisted the problem of having a lower water potential than normal. So in that feedback loop, which goes up and down, the water potential had gone down, and so the negative feedback loop allowed this to bring it back up to an optimal level. Hopefully it wouldn't overshoot, because if this kept going on, we would get a water potential that was too high. So it will eventually slow down and keep it at a normal level. So now we can look at the opposite scenario, where the ADH is designed to decrease the water potential. So the ADH also controls negative feedback for any rise in water potential. So in the same way, we don't want to have too much water in the blood because we can end up diluting our tissues and having a lot of problems in that respect as well. So if the rise above normal levels for water potential is detected again by osmoreceptors, they basically tell the pituitary gland to stop secreting any ADH and stops it from being released. This means that none ends up traveling into the blood. So again, we have our osmoreceptors connected to the pituitary gland as our detector. And this time they've detected that the water potential of the blood is starting to rise and they start swelling. So they actually stop ADH from being released. So none is released. Any ADH that was in the blood will start breaking down because it doesn't have a very long half-life. And if no ADH is being released, the concentration will start to break down. So say earlier on in the day we had ADH present in the blood. Over a few hours, if it's not being released, it will break down. So it's got a quite a short half-life. If the ADH is no longer present, then nothing is binding to the receptors. So if there's less ADH circulating in the blood, the receptors on the collecting duct are not being activated. So there's no ADH to bind to those receptors, no activation of the phosphorylase enzyme, and no triggering to fuse the vesicles with aquaporins to the membrane. So if there's no stimulation to do this, any of the collecting duct cells that have aquaporins in them starts pulling back their membrane into the cell, making the vesicles ready for storage for any time in the future when we do have ADH. So these vesicles with the aquaporins go back into the cell and store the aquaporins there. So again, the invagination of a membrane brings the aquaporins with it. So this reduces the permeability of the collecting duct to water. So less water is taken through to the blood, more water is lost in the urine, and therefore we retain less water. So the water flowing through now no longer has a way to get into the cell. So it passes into urine. And this is the same for urea as well. And therefore less of it is going to the blood because we already have a high water potential in the blood we don't want to get any more. So again, just to summarize the feedback loop, and originally the water potential is raised, so the osmoreceptors, which are the detectors, detect this, and they inhibit the posterior pituitary gland from releasing ADH. So the ADH does not act through the blood, the collecting duct rebrings in all of its aquaporins, water stays in the filtrate, and therefore water is lost in urine, and the water potential of the blood therefore goes down. And because of this, it goes back down to normal levels. And again, this is all one big negative feedback loop. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.